Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. I am a fortunate man because when I hit my 20s, I was exposed to teachers who refused to give praise or express gratitude. These were people who took their cues from the cruelty of the mercy of God in the biblical text. And that's how I've conducted my ministry as a priest. In recent years, it has become more difficult in the United States. Assailed by the angst of materialism and individualism, Americans push themselves further away from the cruelty of God's mercy, desperately seeking comfort, along with answers to the pain that everyone feels inside their troubled hearts, a deep suburban sadness that leads to rage. We all want validation and approval. Unfortunately, a commercial industrial society that seeks to exploit you is eager to please. There is no shortage of false prophets ready to proclaim, good job, thank you, we appreciate you. Now, please write us a check or thank you for your check. Thank you for your amazing efforts. You. You work so hard. Thank you for your beautiful chanting voice, Mark. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for all you do. But this is not love. It is not appreciation. It is exploitation. Such hubris quickly becomes, damn right, I did that. But that is not what was written by the finger of God. When you are born, you are given a munificent gift of immeasurable value for free. It did not come from you or your parents and its only cost is measured at its moment of expiration by the one who provides it. Instead of saying thank you for this free gift, we exploit it as though it is a business opportunity against the will of him who gave it. For, Paul said, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. Yet, our exploitation of God has become institutionalized not just in the churches, but in our families, schools, and government. This is what has happened to us, and it has reached dystopian levels. One can actually hear people espouse beautiful values, whether in the name of Jesus Christ, the civil rights movement, or high-minded secular values. We hear them say beautiful words in Chicago and observe the faithful swoon like evangelicals as they preach, when in fact, what's coming out of their mouth is transactional. It is evil. All who trust in them are like them. But for those who are being saved, who have accepted the comforting cruelty of the cross, the admonition against laughter, well, and praise in Luke is a biblical sign of hope in these troubling and worrisome times. This week, I discuss Luke chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to episode 531 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Woe to you who are writ, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Why on earth? 
why on earth does Jesus have a problem with rich people? Why? I'll tell you why. Because people who are comfortable, unfortunately, have an easier time believing that they are the proprietors of life. They have an easier time believing that they are the ones who provide. It all goes back to that beautiful mashal in Genesis in which God tests Abraham, who is providing the lamb for the offering. People cannot help themselves. They want to believe that they are the ones who provide the lamb for the sacrifice. They want to believe that they are the ones who provide the church. They are the ones who provide children. They are the ones who provide the tribe, the family. That's why God in scripture keeps us wandering in the wilderness, because you don't provide anything. God is the, provi God is the proprietor. He is the king. He is the one who provides everything. We try to rationalize our way out of this. We try to tell ourselves stories, but ultimately it all goes back to him. And sooner or later, we all face this when we end up back in the dust from which we were taken. Everything else is just us spinning tails to comfort ourselves. Us coming up with stories in our head that are other than the story. We tell ourselves whatever we have to say to make ourselves feel good. That's what materialism is. That's what consumerism is. That's what our business plans are. They are our plans and our schemes. But our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our words, our stories are not his words and his stories. But when we have means which are no means whatsoever, but they appear as means, they keep us away from him. But it's an illusion. I love this metaphor in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, because characters in the story who are subject to this illusion, this delusion, this dystopian nonsense, push themselves further away from the horizon of God's judgment by projecting the illusion of their own kingdom, if you will. They're all philosopher tyrants. They imagine their own kingdom and they project it. And in hell, they can build whatever they want. It's like the holodeck on Star Trek, the next generation. They can build whatever they imagine, so they all build mansions for themselves. And they keep pushing themselves further and further away from God in their own personal hell. And that, my friends, is the American suburban life. You imagine that you are seeking comfort, but you are building your own personal hell and creating your own personal misery. Woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. So I want to, once again, go back to the terminology of the text. I'm not going to talk today about the word comfort. I'm going to talk about a word that I'm certain no one pays close attention to unless you play games with theology, and that word is Apechete. Now, this term in Greek, apecho, which means to receive, can also mean to keep yourself away. And it's a very clever word choice by Luke, because this is a term that appears selectively in Paul's letters and likewise selectively in the Gospels. For example, this is the terminology that is used in a very specific way, both 
in Matthew and in Luke, but first by Matthew, which makes it referential because Matthew is syntactically the first book of the Gospels to use it, and therefore it becomes the definition of the term in the New Testament, which draws obviously from the Pauline corpus. Amin lego imin. Apechusin ton mishon afton. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. What reward do they have in full? Let's go back again to how Luke is using the term. But I say, woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving apechate imon tin paraklisin. You are receiving your comfort in full. But what comfort? And it's striking that this term receiving, which is used sparingly just a few times in the New Testament, links receiving with distance and keeping oneself away. Now, when we look to study how this term is connected with the Semitic, we get a much better sense, not just intratextually in the biblical canon, but intertextually with the Quran, what's happening. It's beautiful. So let's start with how this connects to the Old Testament and which Semitic root it's drawing on. Now, there are examples in Isaiah that get closer to the usage in Luke, for example, in Isaiah 29, then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, because they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of tradition they learned by rote. So here again, it's in the Hefeel form. It's the third person plural, meaning remove. But the idea here in Isaiah is that they are clinging to something, in this case, their tradition. But the thing they're clinging to, for example, their religious tradition or their family tradition, in Luke, their wealth or their comfort, whatever it is that makes them, in their minds, feel safe or comfortable, that thing is keeping them far away from God. Lip service, false praise, keeps us far away from God. We give praise, we give gifts that come of our accord. They come from us, they are false gifts because we're trying to do business with God. You can't do business with God. A full church does not mean the Lord is there. A successful business is not a blessing from God. It is not a mark of success. God is the judge. What does it mean that God is the judge? What is the mark of, quote, success, which is not a godly word? What does it mean to be successful in God's eyes? That everybody loves you? Whose love counts in the Gospel of Luke? In righteousness, this is Isaiah 54. We just heard Isaiah 29, verse 13. Isaiah 54, verse 14. In righteousness, you will be established. You will be far, rahak, from oppression meaning God is the one by his hand who establishes you. This is once again the meaning of the Lord setting up his prophet, not the king setting up his monuments in the land. We'll keep explaining this. People won't hear it because they want to build their churches. The Lord is the one who smashes the monuments we set up. He scatters at Luke. One could explain this and explain it and explain it, but it's very difficult for us to hear it because it's not how we function as human beings because we naturally, we naturally 
our men and women of commerce because we are programmed to resist the factuality of the human condition, which is that we all return to the dust. And that the only thing that can truly save us is God's wisdom, his instruction, not the things that we make or build. We really believe that we save the church. We really believe that we save God. That's how we think. We think that we make the church, we build the church, we save the church. The church needs us. That's the problem with it being a monument. In scripture, it's transient. It's a tent of meeting, and the tent is not the reference. It is the one who sets up his tent, which can't be depicted. Because the Torah covers the tent, and the tent covers the Torah, how can that be depicted? You can't depict it. Because the one who speaks is himself undepictable. And he said to me, son of man, do you see? This is Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 6. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here so that I would be far rahak from my sanctuary, but yet you will see greater abominations. So this is distance from the sanctuary. Either you are away from God or you are keeping God away. Ezekiel eleven fifteen, And remember, this is Ezekiel where the name of God's city is the Lord is there. Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your fellow exiles, and the whole house of Israel, all of them are those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far, yalla bai, rahak from the Lord. This land has been given to us. It's a gift. You don't own it. Possession is a bad translation once again. I'm not going to go into that right now. The point is, it's a gift. So I want to talk now about the corresponding Quranic function. Rahiq in Arabic means a choice or a pure wine. And metaphorically, of course, implies something valuable or rare. Rich people love nice wine. I've had to endure this in corporate life for many years. I myself don't care about fancy wine, but people love to talk about fancy wine. I don't know why that is, but that's how people are. If it tastes nice, I drink it. I'm like my dad. He's like, Mark, if it tastes nice, I drink it. If it doesn't, I get something else. What's the big deal? I'm with you, Pops. Anyways, people pride themselves on liking certain types of wine, whatever. But that's how rich people are. Because if you can say that it's exquisite and special, then it costs more. And you can claim that you're special because you can spend more money. That's how these people think. What can you do? That's how it works. Okay, that's the system. That's the mentality of the wealthy. They want something valuable and rare because they fancy themselves valuable and rare. But no one is valuable and rare except the Most High God. So if you want valuable and rare wine, come to church and I will serve you communion. But in the Quran, this idea of something being distant or special or precious, which is linked to this root, the same biblical function is associated with wine, which is this luxurious or heavenly drink. Aha. Fascinating how this works. So it's actually in the Quran, in Surah Al-Muttafin, 
83.25, this reference to the heavenly wine. It's playing on the same Semitic function. You can either seek comfort in the drink of the wealthy, in the finer things of the wealthy, in the stuff you buy on Amazon or the stuff you buy at a California vineyard, which comes from you and pushes God away and pushes you away from his wisdom. Or you can pursue his wisdom, which is the unreachable, the unreachable treasure in the heavens in Matthew, the heavenly drink which is here mentioned in the Quran. It's beautiful. And you can't partake of the heavenly drink. You cannot partake of this beautiful wine by writing a check. Because the good things in life are free. Or as the Beatles said, money can't buy me love. Money can't buy me love. Don't seek compliments. Don't seek the praise of men. Don't look for people who thank you for your donation. And if a priest or a bishop thanks you for your efforts or shows appreciation, run and hide. Run and hide. Seek first the kingdom of the heavens, which is beyond your reach, and all these things will be added to you. So rahiq can be a pure or choice wine, but it's something distant, unreachable. And obviously, it can also in Arabic mean to press or to squeeze, because that's how you make wine. It can also pertain to adolescence or puberty, because it can mean to approach. You approach to receive the Eucharist. But you pursue, so it sometimes in certain uses can mean to move quickly, yalla, to move quickly in pursuit. You have to pursue the kingdom. You have to pursue that which is unreachable. Not because someone's telling you good job, but because the wise person seeks the pearl of great price. So rahiq means to approach or to come near. And there's this beautiful, Arabic is such a beautiful, beautiful language. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a language of poetry, as is Hebrew. Semitic language is a language of poetry, and that's why God undermines poetry in these sacred texts. Because poetry is the language of desire. And the sacred texts undermine human desire poetically. It's quite beautiful. But there's this expression in Arabic, rahiq al qamar. And anyone who knows Arabic music, Arabic literature, Arabic poetry knows that the moon is such an important part of Arabic expression. Arabic music pines at the moon, as does. Arabic poetry. So this expression is the way of referring to the nectar of the moon. But you can't reach the moon. Just like, again, the Gospel of Matthew admonishes us, your reward is in the heavens. You are grasping at something beyond your reach. What reward are you looking for? What reward did Jesus receive? Come on, people. Children are dying. There's something happening here. And what it is, is very clear. Life is very serious, and it is not ours. The care of children is very serious. And you actually refer to your child as yours? This is no game. The other word in this verse that I want to touch on quickly is this Greek term, plusis, which means Rich in Greek, it corresponds to another 
Hebrew function, a Semitic function in the Bible. Ayn, Shin, Resh, Ashir is the way that it is rendered in its lexical correspondence to the Greek in the Gospel of Luke. Again, it comes from this root, Ayn, Shin, Resh. This root is associated with, once again, wealth, abundance, richness which keeps us away from the wisdom of God, away from his beneficence and generosity. And it's the same function both in Biblical Hebrew and Arabic. The Arabic verb means to be satisfied, to eat one's fill. This Semitic usage should ring in your ears as we move forward into the next verse. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Laughter, and it's important that we heed this admonition because the mistake of the social justice crowd is to imagine just as those who seek praise and gratitude, like the older son in the parable of the merciful father, the older son stays home and thinks he should get credit for all that he's done. It's re really stupid, really foolish thinking. You know, in, in the story of the merciful father who receives the prodigal, those who are downtrodden imagine that they should take vengeance and they should be able to laugh at those who oppress them. But that's not what this text is saying. One must hear it within its syntax and itinerary. I will not say context, because if I say context, you're going to abstract something in your platonic mind and start spinning a theology. You can't do that. I return once again to the language and function and lexicography of the biblical text. Abraham's son whom he was willing to sacrifice in obedience. And your ethicists in your theology schools hate this story, and they have a psychological crisis every time they try to explain it because they refuse to accept the factuality of the human condition. They refuse to accept their own fate, which is that we all return to the dust. And so they moralize the text, which isn't what this is about. God is laughing at Abraham and Sarah. It's hawk. It is God's laughter. Just like it is God's offering. It is God who provides the lamb. God provides the children. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You provide nothing. It makes no sense to any of us. But that is the rule, as Paul says, in all the churches, God's name be praised. And if you can't accept it, you are rejecting not the Lord's prophet, not the Lord's teacher. You are rejecting God. Your beef is not with me. Your beef is with God. No matter how you rationalize it to yourself, and it is a serious matter, and it is my duty to make it clear to you. Beyond that, my conscience is clear. So it is God who is saying to the ones who laugh, you will weep because God will be laughing in the judgment. Remember that Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? Who was the joke on in the end? The joke was on Abraham, and you are the children of Abraham, which means the joke, Habibi, 
is on you. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Are you hearing Luke? Are you hearing Jesus and the gospel of Luke? It's plain language, even in your colonial English Bible. I'm going to say it again. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Do you think when people speak ill of the prophet, the prophet should feel bad? Do you think when you enumerate all the people who are angry at the prophet, the prophet should think to himself, gee, I wonder if I made a mistake? Think about it. Who should the prophet be concerned about? All the people who are upset that the prophet enumerated the content of the scroll? Or should the prophet be concerned about what Jesus said? Let me read it again. Woe to you when all men, all men, speak well of you. It doesn't say woe to you if a bunch of people are upset at you. It says woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Hmm. There it is. Yalla. Bye. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.